You know, we've actually discussed various characters' fears and innermost terrors several times in this episode. We've never, or in this episode, wow, in this series, we've never really discussed Garibaldi's, have we? And yet, we see pretty clearly Garibaldi's fear in the very beginning dream. I actually wrote down the specific messages. Where were you? You failed us. We needed you. There's a lot of weight behind those words, and it shows a tremendous amount about Garibaldi and his mentality. Yes, of course he wants to be in control of things, but more to the point, what he really wants is to be in control of things because of what he's afraid of. If he's in control, well, that doesn't happen. If he's in control, that doesn't come to pass. I understand that mentality a lot, actually. Because it's not about the control, really. It's not like you're a, oh, I must be in control. It's, I want to do everything that is within my power to ensure that these terrible dark things do not occur. And Garibaldi is a hell of a cynic who's been through a hell of a lot. So he can imagine quite a few bad things occurring. Question. Was Lita actually there? I'm just going to leave that there. I've heard a couple of thoughts on this. Red, I should clarify. A couple of thoughts on this and whether or not, you know, Lita was actually there or not. It's up to you. Her eyes were glowing white, which is more indicative of Vorlon than her own, you know, black iris power that she's used in the past. So, what was going on? Now, you might say, well, I mean, it makes sense if it's her because she is trying to expand her power and whatnot, but... Why do that on Garibaldi while he sleeps? That seems kind of, to be as blunt as I can, scummy. I'll let you decide. And you might be like, well, what is it if it's not Lita? Well, uh, whatever Garibaldi might think of Lita, Garibaldi doesn't trust telepaths. At all. Repeatedly. Uh, especially given recent events. So, at this point, it's a nice, convenient blame... Uh, I forget the actual term. There is a term for this in dream, where you see someone, but you're not actually dreaming about that person. You're dreaming about a concept, and that person just happens to represent what you're dreaming about. I forget what that's called, so forgive me. But that thing. <clears throat> so a couple notes here, just really quick. Uh, continuing Lita's arc, she's still reaching out, trying to, to carry on Byron's task of establishing, you know, a home role for them, doing all this stuff. I loved the scene between her and Jakar, the second one. The first one was kind of awkward. second one was great. You know, we want your right to spy and, and see in on the other ambassadors, and Lita's like, no. And I love how she's like, you know, I, I have some shreds of decency left in me. And then Jakar's like, excellent. I mean, we all saw that coming. Even if, let's be blunt, even if the Narn government insisted on that, which I would believe, Jakar would never accept that. And Jakar, at this point in his life, really does not give a good goddamn about what his government says. So he would be the kind of person who'd be like, oh, you want me to tell her to go spy on other people? Okay. Oops! Ah, the comm just ended. I'm not even sure why. And he probably wouldn't even carry on the message. Just be like, sorry, nope. So there is no way in hell that I could buy that Jakar would be along with this and be like, you know, that's the terms of the deal. So that was kind of an obvious test. But only from our perspective. Lita doesn't know Jakar. So she doesn't understand that, and it worked quite well for those purposes. Also, the Lita Jakar thing, along with the reuse of that one restaurant's um, set from all the way back in season one, is a nice touch. It reminds me again of that theme of the story's ending thing that I've talked about, which is funny because a story literally just began with the whole Centauri possible war thing coming. So once again, it's just it's just doing this. It's like one, sto one story's beginning and the other story's ending, and I don't, I don't even know what to make of it at this point. It just feels off. I've already given my thoughts on that. Moving on. 
you remember, well, before I get to that, let's talk about Liz. So Liz finds the booze. It's pretty obvious why she reacts the way she does. She goes from being pleasant and loving and kind to just being like shkong in a second. And I could see some per people looking at that and judging her fairly harshly. But remember, she's been around for this type of thing more than once. And we know just how much this has destroyed not only Garibaldi, but the two's relationship. So she kind of has a reason at this point to be like, nope. I mean, how many times have you heard the words, oh, it'll be different this time? So I do appreciate the way she presents herself there and the fact that she is willing to talk about it, willing to be reasonable. He actually goes over and empties the bottle in the sink on the spot. That's a hell of a maneuver right there. Problem is, even as he was doing it, my first thought was, damn, that looks like a false thing. Like, like That looks like the kind of thing you do to show how sincere you are in order to distract them from the other stash you've got on the side. And lo and behold... He's got that little pocket flask and puts it in his coffee, and yeah, Garibaldi officially has a problem because he's stressed, he's strung out, and a lot of people drink. I shouldn't say it that way. See, I've never had an alcohol problem. I don't actually drink in real life. I can't stand alcohol. Nothing against people who drink. Uh, I mean, most of my family drinks, most of, several of my friends do, but... Everyone involved does so with a degree of moderation and intelligibility. You know, it's like drink a bit, have fun, and then that's it for like the week kind of a thing. You know, that's not really an alcoholic problem. But everyone I've talked to who, uh, does, who does drink on a semi-regular basis or a semi-rare basis says that one of the reasons they do so is to help them relax, to help them uh, enjoy themselves or enjoy them, get into a a pleasant glow as far as a mood goes. And again, I have to take their word on this. I have actually never been drunk in my life. I have actually consumed a decent amount of alcohol here and there, but it's never actually gotten me drunk. Uh, your guess is as good as mine as to why. I bring this up, though, because all of this helps to un explain why it is that Garibaldi, when he is very stressed, and he's just trying to have a nice evening with the love of his life, he just really needs a drink because it just keeps messing up and there's stress and there's this situation. I don't want to have this argument again. He's on edge. Now, I don't know 100% how having an alcoholic problem goes because I don't drink. But I've seen and I have seen the effects and it gets to the point where it is a f base addiction. One of the reasons he is so bleh, is because of the fact that he is without the thing that helps him to calm down. Like that train going by right now. You know, I'm kind of because the train's going by right now. I don't want to drink because of it. Maybe get some, you know, seltzer water or something like that. But <laughs> you get the point, though, right? What I'm trying to say is it's understandable why he needs that drink in that moment. But it's horrible and wrong, too. Let me explain what I mean by that. You notice how earlier, when Liz confronts him, he, he at first denies it. He didn't bring it up at all. He wasn't upfront about it. He didn't say, yeah, I'm, I've kind of been having a drinking problem, and I may need help with it. No, he, he tried to hide it. He tried to deny it. And when she confronted him about it, he pulled that classic Garibaldi move and sidelined the actual issue by bringing up something else and then attacking that, verbally, of course. And then he has that problem at the restaurant. Now, if it was just for that moment, I'd just say that Garibaldi is still in a bit of denial and still doesn't really think he has a problem or acknowledge it or whatever. But that thing, that thing at the restaurant makes it clear. Garibaldi is officially an alcoholic as of this point in time. He is sufficiently gone that we now have a problem. You see... When you introduce something like alcohol, I actually know a decent amount about the chemical effects of alcohol. You know, I probably don't feel like speechifying about this, and you don't care. All I'm going to say is that when you get to the point where your brain starts releasing certain chemicals on a regular basis in order to combat the inclusion of a poison into it, into your system, and it does so with such regularity that you get messed up when that poison isn't there, you officially have a problem. And it, it gets harder and harder to deal with that, the worse that gets. Because, believe it or not, the body is really good at adapting. 
And that's what happens when people become addicted. It is actually the body adapting to the inclusion of the substance or the alcohol or the liquid or the whatever. That's what addiction is. And it's messed up. And it kind of tears me apart to see this happening to Garibaldi, a character I've cared about for five years at this point. Well, obviously longer than five years. But you get the, you get the idea. Five seasons, let's put it that way. So, we once again see that the other races are more than willing to blame the Centauri. That everyone's fixated on the Centauri. I once again emphasize that this is either bad writing, or that this is the witch hunt mentality. It is almost, I, I firmly believe it is coincidental that the Centauri are actually behind this. You know, the, those that are in the know are behind this. Although, I have an interesting question for you guys. The gentleman that Londo talked to back on Homeworld, do you think he was in on the plot or not? Because we know there's plenty of Centauri who are not. We actually interacted with a few. One of them was killed the last time we were on Homeworld. So do you think they were in on it? Just food for thought. Because it's entirely possible he was not. And therefore, from his perspective, they're not behind these attacks. And therefore, the fact that they're trying to blame them for it, well, that's an issue. And of course, from a Centauri perspective, I mean, notice how he outmaneuvers Londo verbally. That's almost amazing. You know, he says, ah, oh, they're trying to, to, to frame us. And Londo says, no, I know Sheridan, I know Delenn, there's no way in hell they would frame us. Well, yes, of course, they wouldn't frame us, but what about the Narn? Jakar would never frame us. Oh, well, no, of course not Jakar, but what about the Narn who think that Jakar is too close to the Centauri? And there's no counter-argument for that one, is there? I mean, the reasonability of the Narn having access to that many Centauri ships is a possible counter-argument, but you get the idea. From the perspective of the Centauri individual, assuming he is innocent of these wrongdoings, it does make sense from a Centauri mindset that the Narn would be sufficiently willing to push their hatred of the Centauri to engage in such a large-scale false false flag operation. It really does. But I digress. One of the things that I find interesting, the ships were communicating and the, and the words that were being relayed were, do not reply. Now obviously there's some logical military intelligence reasons for that, that Lanier and Montoya both talk out really well. I don't feel the need to recover that. What I do want to mention is that when I first heard that, my first thought was, I wonder how many of the people on those ships know whom they're firing on, or why? Bonus question. How many of them do you think care? You remember that whole speech Londo gave about the guard post guarding a single spot in the garden for two centuries? You remember that? I get the very strong impression the Centauri don't actually care why the orders are given. And I think that's probably one of the biggest flaws of the Centauri Republic right there. Doesn't matter why the order was given, the order was given. Emperor said, go do this. Okay. Hmm. I love how when Sheridan confronts Delenn about it, first of all, he's not actually upset about what she did. He's upset about the fact that she sidelined him and didn't talk to him up front about it. Of course, that's very keeping with Sheridan's character. The honesty, the openness thing. We've talked about that many times. Rehash, rehash. But I also love how she pretty much turns the conversation right back around onto him. It's actually rather brilliant the way she does it. And she succeeds rather brilliantly, too. He's even amused as he's... And that amusement kind of breaks the anger. <laughs> I, I could talk about that for a bit, but... All I'm going to say is that it is an excellent strategy when someone is angry with you to try and evoke another emotion within them. And laughter or amusement is one of the best choices there because you'd be amazed how much seeing something genuinely funny or having your spirit uplifted or however you want to think of that pretty much cracks anger right in two. It, at least in me. I should clarify that. I've, I've seen that in me and I've seen that in my interactions with other people. Uh, when I was... Uh, dealing with other people in person on a much more regular basis, either because you know my leg was still better, or I was going out and about all the time, or I worked at a service job as a manager at Arby's, which was a service job. I had to deal with all the customers. It was one of my most um, utilized strategies. 
if you will. Someone shows up and they're angry, and so I'm like, hey, manage to get them to smile. That anger just kind of goes away. And as soon as that anger goes away, that's when I come back and I'm like, so, let me pay for your meal for you. Let me, let me comp that for you. And then, in addition to their anger having just deflated, and the fact that they just saw or heard something funny, now they leave with, with an overall positive impression. Boom! That's why I call that a service thing. You can go ahead and make fun of me. I worked at Arby's. I'm not ashamed of it. I learned a lot about interacting with people working at that Arby's. So, <clears throat> one of the things that makes sense to me, there's two things. I've, I've got two more things to talk about. First, it is interesting and very logical how Sheridan is so much more emotionally capable of dealing with the emotional baggage that comes from losing someone you care about. Delenn does not romantically love Lanier. She never has. But she does love him. She cares about him, clearly and demonstrably, many times over. And, yeah. I mean, what else do I need to add to that? So, her... It's clear, based on how she reacted before they got word, and how she reacted when they got word, she wasn't processing it. She didn't know how to. Sheridan was the one who was an experienced military vet, who is, you know, Look, we need to face reality, and she's like, no, 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 no. It's a nice back and forth. And of course, the scene where she hugs Londo was actually very touching and kind of horrible when you really think about it. Then, of course, the other thing I wanted to talk about, which I don't remember. I'm sorry, I don't remember what it was. I, I was just really, it was, oh, yes, yes. The nature of the attacks. We've already seen that they're attacking transports without intent to capture. Now, the funny thing is, if you really sit back and think logically and intellectually without getting emotional about the situation, well, that's actually nonsensical. That's literally warmongering. The only, literally, the only possible motivation for doing that kind of burn-all attack is if you are all, well, I'm sorry, there, I'm sorry, there are two reasons. If you're already at war and are denying them resources, which they're not, or if you're trying to provoke a war to be in the former situation. That's it. If you are trying to get ready for war, like if the Centauri thought they were going to war with them, then they would use those attacks to capture and claim, because they would need those resources to prosecute the war. If they were trying to uh, wage a war of aggression, same thing. Those resources, that money, those people, that's all value. That's all something that can be used for their, their greater expansion. And don't tell me the Centauri don't know how to conquer. I mean, stupidity is always the explanation for everything, but you get my point, right, from a tactical perspective? No. If you sit back and look at this, the only logical purpose behind this kind of naked aggression is to provoke. And if you have seemingly one power, who is at a weakened state compared to the others, actively provoking an alliance of everyone else, something's up. That is not what it appears to be. I'm sorry. Now that brings me to my next point, and arguably my last point. All of this is kind of obvious what the Drach are doing here and their machinations. They're just straight up saying, up. Oh, War, war, war. And they're going for war as hard and fast as possible. And they're doing it by basically committing atrocities. It is the relative equivalent of one nation who wants war for whatever reason, walking out and saying, hey, so I just brought these innocent civilians out here to shoot in front of y'all. And that's disgusting and horrible and abhorrent, even more so the fact that the only reason to do so is to provoke the response. Which... Brings me to my final point. They've said many times that this is shipping that is being hit. They've never really shined a personal light on that. Th thus far, it's always been something kind of distant. And that's fine. But shipping doesn't just mean cargo. Shipping also means people, passenger liners. What these Centauri willing or not, caring or not, just did was attack the, the equivalent of, of, you know, transcontinental buses. 
And that's horrible. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just stuttering over this because it really is horrible. It is truly abhorrent. And that is the point. We see this from Lanier's perspective. We hear the calm. We see Lanier's face. Whatever you may say about Lanier, this affects him deeply. And probably helps to strengthen his resolve to make sure that this information gets out. Because all he's thinking is, these guys are going to burn. But that's the point. As I already highlighted, if emotion gets too strong, the intellect kind of gets drowned out. I guess we'll see the results of this soon. See you around, guys.